بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم ما بعد أيها الأحباب A lot of our differences and a lot of the controversy especially between Ahl Sunnah results primarily from a lack of understanding of how to deal with differences and the various types of differences. As we mentioned in the beginning of this treatise, in the beginning of our study, we talked about al-ikhtilaf, uh, al-ikhtilaf uh, wa ikhtilaf fabad. means many different gradations of differing, which in fact it doesn't contradict each other. For example, uh, with the the various uh, types of Hajj, for example, to Mettur, Ifrad, and with those differences that one performing the Umrah with the Hajj and so forth, those differences do not, they would be considered Ikhtilaf, a Tanoa, meaning that there's variations regarding the same uh, act of ibadah or the same issue. Or another example might be during the Salat. Uh, for example, after being in sujood or being in sajda and or whether to raise the hand during sajda uh, when, when a person moves from even from every uh, various position, for example, ruku, coming up from ruku, uh, going into ruku, going into sajda, to do uh, with every takbir to raise the hands. We would say that this is not ikhtilaf tabad, this is ikhtilaf tanawa. This is a difference in, a, in the furu, you know, in the various branches not in the asul, not in the foundations like aqidah or creed or minhaj, but these are in other aspects of ibadah, which we have nasus or text, which illustrate that the Prophet Sallallahu did it in various ways, that we have text to support doing it, doing an act of worship, maybe more than one way, in more than one way. And it comes from the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu So these kind of issues are ikhtilaf to, uh, to Noah of, of gradations, of types, various types. Then ikhtilaf tabad, as we mentioned, is when we differ regarding uh, in, 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 in totality. That's one of the names. What is ikhtilaf tabad? Also ikhtilaf sa'id, they, they refer to uh, in, in one of the books that we, we we added to, uh, or we explored some of the some of these issues in in the prior lessons, and that type of difference is where you have a difference of opinion over an issue, and they're in total opposition to one another, total contradiction, uh, and often. This results in things, especially in creed, you have a lot of ikhtilaf tabad, meaning that ahl bid'a, for example, may see something as permissible, and they try to use the text of the Quran and the Sunnah or weak uh, ahadith of the Prophet wasallam or fabricated one to su fabricated ones to support their view, or from ta'wil, or from uh, misinterpreting those nasus. To support their belief, for example, if you talk to some of the more extreme Sufis, especially some that have some some knowledge, meaning that they have studied, or some of their scholars that ha have strength in the Arabic language, strength in uh, maybe in fiqh and things like this, but their aqidah is in need of uh, strengthening because they are deviant. In that, and with regards to that asul, with their asul being uh, deviant, then it often affects their other aspects of ibadah as well. 
So for example, you may have some from amongst them that have some knowledge, that have memorized, they have some fiqh, and they come from the aspect of the Arabic language. They look into the text, they say, well, this is what it means in Arabic. Okay, and they go deep into the, to the, to the language, deep into the nahu, into the sarf, and into the balagha, and the all, various branches of the Arabic language, and they explain Quranic text or hadith with those, um, uh, just using the Arabic language, for example, instead of looking at the mustalahat shari'ah, meaning those, the sharia terms, the terms that the uh, Prophet sallallahu explained and that the Sahaba explained and understood and the Tabi'een with Taba'i Tabi'een. So sometimes you'll have a, uh, in many cases, you have uh, in, in, in the terminologies, you have a Sharia terminology and then you have a, a, linguistic, <coughs> a linguistic terminology that depends upon the Arabic language. And then that means you have a different meaning. So this has an effect on their ibadah. So, for example, they'll say, well, uh, this is just giving an example, that uh, maybe going around the graves, making tawaf around the graves is permissible. And they'll try to use a, a nust or a, a text to support that. And perhaps they may fool the layperson with their strength in the Arabic language in the way they explain away things. Or they may uh, mis uh, reinterpret uh, text as well as terminologies to support their view or their madhab. This goes against the, the methodology of Ahl Sunnah. So Ahl Sunnah, for example, would say no, maybe in this particular issue that it's Muharram. And they will say no, this is actually Mustahab, this is actually liked and you'll get extra reward for doing this act of going around the grave uh, and, and, and supplicating to the grave or something like this. And this is from their ta'wil. So this type of difference is ikhtilaf tadad. This is the ikhtilaf where they are in total opposites. There's no way to, to find a compromise between those various forms of various views about ibadah and which in fact have an uh, influence or also are related to creed. And so one of the issues that we face is how to deal with the various differences, how to understand that differences are of different types and that there are sometimes when it, uh, when a person makes a mistake, that it, of course, does not mean, uh, well, for one, they may make a mistake and they might, it might not be sinful, meaning that they might not be a sinner due to some excuse, excuse of ignorance, the excuse of ta'wil, or, or what have you. Or they may even fall into an act of disbelief, an act of kufr. And with, with, with regards to that, they might be ma'dhur as well, as the ulama uh, explain coming from Kitab Allah wa Sunnah Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and those Dawabit that the ulama, those criterion that the ulama have put forth. And likewise, or in addition to, is the issue of tibdi, of considering someone an innovator. It also is very much related to that, meaning that someone can fall into doing a bid'ah but not be a mubtidiyah. And this is very important for us to understand. And this is what Shaykh Islam ibn Taymiyyah said. And many uh, other ulama go to the books of Ibn al-Qayyim. And we've mentioned it in this very dars. Go back to it. Uh, we're not going to spend more time on that. But now we've, we've moved on to <coughs> the place in the treaties of Shaykh Abdul Masin al-Abad. Hafidullah Ta'ala. Once again, gentleness, O people of the Sunnah, with people of the Sunnah. We reached the part, part we, we already spoke about making hajr of people. So I think it's very important for us to quickly go back over what Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah said with regards to this, some of his, his statements, and then moving on to what Shaykh Abdul Masin said. So in this point in the treaties, the Shaykh said, Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah said, it is clear pure light, or clear pure light is not found, if clear pure light is not found, and nothing remains except light, that contains some impurity, whereby if the people do not take from this unclear light, then they will be left in total darkness. It is not appropriate in this situation to neither blame the person nor forbid the people from light that contains some form of darkness, unless one cannot find light not containing any darkness at all. So this is very important. The Shaykh was mentioning this example. Shaykh Islam ibn Taymiyyah, Rahimullah Ta'ala, was mentioning 
this in light of, for example, we have uh, make it, making this likeness between uh, someone who has some mistakes, uh, perhaps in Aqidah, perhaps in Minhaj, yes, Aqidah in Minhaj, mistakes, but yet most of what they call to is the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu or they're, they're from Ahl Sunnah, but yet they've fell, fallen into a mistake or more. It's not just reserved to, oh, he had one mistake. So this is what we have to realize, that a person can have several mistakes that they made that is not taking them off the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu those mistakes are mistakes. Those mistakes could be involved bid'ah, but we have to deal with that person uh, accordingly. And so here, Sheikh Islam was making it uh, a point that perhaps you may have a situation, and we definitely have these kind of situations in America and other places in far off lands, where we don't have a, a lot of scholarship. We don't have ulama and things like this, and especially major scholars. And so perhaps you may have someone in a locality who's calling to Tawheed. They're calling to a lot of good. They're calling to Kitab Allah wa Sunnah Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in general. They may have some mistakes. They may have some minhaj mistakes even, perhaps. They may have some issues in, uh, you know, what have you. They may even have some slight leanings towards certain jama'at. But in general, what they call to is Kitab wa Sunnah and the understanding of the Salaf. This is in general. But in some issues, some messiah, they make mistakes and they call it, they deviate in those mistakes. So what do you do in a situation like this? And you don't have someone who's from Ahl Sunnah, who is, has the same level of knowledge, who's teaching and is giving light to the people in that area. Do you abandon that light? so that the people will be in darkness and maybe a Sufi will come or someone, an extreme uh, takfiri will be their imam or someone else or do the people benefit from that person and you do not warn against that person. This is, this is the, the mas'ala here. This is the issue uh, in which Shaykh al-Islam is highlighting in general and I just took this mas'ala uh, from that. that and, and it has many different forms in, in, in different situations in, in per, 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 pertinent to the particular locality you might reside in. So that doesn't mean because you saw so-and-so, he has this mistake and it's well known, or so-and-so's refuted him, or this and that and the other, but yet in general this person gives very beneficial durus. Durus, they're calling you to Kitab al-Sunnah, and they are calling to the Madhab of the Salaf, but they have some mistakes in a certain issue, or they made a couple of statements. But there's no one else to revolve them, meaning there's no one from Ahl Sunnah in that area who can replace them, that you have to go to, that you can turn the people alternatively to. Then of course benefit from that person. And don't destroy that person's character and belittle them so that they are destroyed and you have darkness in that area. As long as you have someone who's teaching khair, let them teach khair. Let them teach khair and don't criticize them, don't belittle them, don't try to destroy them, and especially leave the place empty and full of darkness. And this is a big mistake that many people uh, make, many of our brothers and sisters, and, and Sheikh Islam Ibn Taymiyyah is dealing with it. Our scholars of today are dealing with it. Why are we still having the same problems and same issues? It's because the people, la yafqahum, they don't have fiqh, they don't have an understanding of the religion, they don't read. They read maybe some certain things would support their uh, sternness only. But they don't read all of the text. They don't read the other text which support that come from the Salaf of this Ummah. They don't go back to the Ahadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Was the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, only stern? No, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was stern when, when it was necessary related to the religion. But mostly he was on rifq and being gentle and lean and being latif and rahim. He, had mercy, mer he was merciful. He was a mercy to mankind. So this is how we should be uh, when we call to the Qur'an and the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Then Shaykh Islam Ibn Taymiyyah said, How many people do we find who strayed away from light that contained some form of darkness and ended up leaving alone the light in its entirety? Similar to the above is a saying of some people, Truth is just one single entity and cannot be divided. So either take all of it or leave off all of it. This is all in Mijmu'a Fatawa, Shaykh Islam Ibn Taymiyyah. So if someone, somebody possesses some of the truth, he is to be advised to preserve that which he has. 
and at the same time strive in attaining that which he is deficient of. This is what Sheikh Abdul Masin al Abad said, Hafidullah Ta'ala, this Alam Rabbani, that benefit from him. You know, if you have a person in your locality, he has some issues. Okay? We're just saying that he has some issues. We're not saying that this person is clear a deviant. This clear, you know, is clearly after Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu that they are not uh, aslan from Ahlul Sunnah. No, we're not talking about that. We're talking about how to deal with Ahlul Sunnah. Someone who is mistaken from Ahlul Sunnah, who's made some mistakes and some issues that have become clear that they're mistakes. You know, how do we deal with them? Then uh, he said, the praiseworthy and correct type of boycotting. So then he began to talk about boycotting here. Is the one that contains benefit in it, and it is not that which causes harm. Shaykh al-Islam said, if it was the case that every time two Muslims differed in a matter, they boycott each other, there would not remain any preservation or brotherhood between the Muslims. This is also in Majmu'ah Majmu of Fatawa. Uh, then Shaykh, Shaykh, and Shaykh Abdul Masin said, uh, he, he, also, he, he also said, this is also Shaykh al-Islam, boycotting differs according to those who boycott. It depends on their strength and weakness, whether they are in the minority or majority. So it lets us know that there's there's conditions for boycotting, and there are uh, moana. There are things that prohibit boycotting, and there are things that we need to look at in place to look at the harms and the benefit before you just up and abandon your brothers and sisters in Islam. Before you begin to just speak about your brothers and sisters in, a, in Islam in a bad way, you have to know that there's conditions for that. It's not just based on our desires or because you heard, oh, I heard Sheikh so and so refuted so and so, khalas, he's hit, and let's begin to speak about his honor and his integrity and the burn his tapes. No, it doesn't, it's not like that. It's not like that. That's not how you practice Islam. That's not how you practice these kawaid and these principles. And that shows us the detail of these issues, that they're not light issues. And they're not for the layperson. They're for the students of knowledge. They're for the uh, mashayikh and the imams and those people who have some, some knowledge to know when to implement these, these things. And the layperson should generally not even be involved in these affairs at all. This is what Sheikhana, uh, what, what Imam uh, uh, Sheikh Salih bin Fuzan, Hafidullah Ta'ala, one of the, our greatest Mashaykh al Sunnah that is living in this time. Uh, I said one of them. And he, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless him, uh, has mentioned this in, in many times, in many of his, his lectures and in the questions posed to him uh, about this issue. That these are detailed issues and they're not for the lay person. So then uh, uh, Sheikh Islam ibn Taymiyyah said, The objective behind boycotting is to rebuke the one who is being boycotted and to discipline him, as well as deterring the other common Muslims from falling into the same mistakes. If the advantage and benefit of boycotting therefore outweighs the harm that will result from it, whereby the evil will be decreased, weakened, and concealed, then in this situation boycotting is legislated. So meaning if the harm is better than the, the uh, if the uh, benefit is better than the harm, then in this case, it's legislated to boycott. But if it's the opposite, no. Boycotting others is not carried out, however, if the one being boycotted or other than him will not be deterred from this action. So it's not going to stop the person from the action. Rather, the evil will only increase. It, it's only going to increase them in evil. Or the one boycotting is in a position of weakness. So the one who's boycotting is also weak. And they're in a position of weakness. And therefore the harms of boycotting will be, will be more than the benefit. So in these situations, these two situations that he mentioned, the harms of boycotting will be more than the benefit. If this is known, I mean if the person uh, knows these, uh, these principles and they know they're aware of the masadiq and the mafasid of doing these these uh, practicing these ahkam with the individuals that they want to boycott or what have you, uh, then uh, then you have to weigh those things. You have to weigh the harms and the benefits of the thing of the of boycotting. So he said, if this is known, then Islamic boycotting is an action of obedience ordered by Allah and His Messenger. Some Allah said them, any act of obedience must be done sincerely for the sake of Allah and also conform to his order. If boycotting is done sincerely for the sake of Allah, then it's correct. 
whoever boycotts another person due to his personal desire or the boycott is not in conformity to that which has been legislated, then this type of boycotting is not correct. How often do people do something due to their own personal desires, thinking at the same time <coughs> that it's being done out of obedience to a law? So Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah ta'ala, mentions very beneficial points there that, again, you have to look at the harms and the benefits of boycotting. If the benefit of boycotting someone outweighs the harm, then this would be legislated. If not, then it's not legislated. Then they, you shouldn't do it because that means you're helping to spread more evil. You're not actually helping to deter evil because that's what it's about. He also mentioned, and this leads into what I was saying, is that this is an act of ibadah. That when you do these things, you should be doing it solely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not because your friends said so. Not because you have the peer pressure of the other brothers. You're afraid. They're boycotting. So we need to, I need to boycott. I feel the pressure. If I don't boycott this person, they'll put pressure on me. Or they'll boycott me. Or they'll speak about me. You can't let those things uh, deter you. You've got to be, if you're a man, be a man about it. And be uh, a strong Muslim man. And... Uh, and rely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as much as possible. If you fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more, then Allah will protect you and preserve you. And that's just the way it is. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us and preserve us and forgive us for any and all forms of weakness that we all possess. Then he said, uh, Allah ta'ala, the people of knowledge have mentioned that if a scholar makes a mistake, it is not correct to follow up the scholar in that mistake. Neither is it correct to disassociate from him due to that error. Rather, his mistake will be expiated and forgiven due to his many good deeds. This is very important that we don't follow up the mistakes uh, of the, especially the ulama, especially, but even the students of knowledge, even the talab al -ta You shouldn't spend your time going through and chasing up their mistakes and chasing up their, their shortcomings, especially if they're from Ahl Sunnah. And this is in general the context this whole treatise is in the context of dealing with Ahl Sunnah. In general, you shouldn't spend your time uh, doing research on how to uh, belittle someone or looking at their shortcomings. However, that is specifically reserved to the students of knowledge and the ulama regarding Ahl Bid'ah. Meaning if there's someone who is a Mubtadi'ah, who's, who's a harm to the community, their Aqidah, their creed and their methodology, and they're spreading that those ideologies which are un-Islamic ideologies, then in this case, of course, it's mishroor to warn against them or deal with them with the other ahkam of the sharia. And along with that, along with dealing with them with that ahkam is knowing, uh, again, the masala and the mafasid, knowing the, the, the harms, the, the benefits and the harms, and having fiqh. And again, this is reserved for ahl ilm This is reserved for the people of knowledge, the scholars and the... Uh, the, the students of knowledge that have the ability, you know, these are, we're not just saying anyone, oh, mashallah, he studies at Jami and such and such, he's done the Arabic program, or this one, he's doing this. No, it's not for everyone. We're talking about people who have, who are grounded in knowledge, and they're, they're familiar, they've studied these issues with the ulama, and that they have some, uh, they have some background, not just for anyone just to pick up a book even, and just start, even if they have some Arabic or something, start translating and just, uh, and then trying to practice that and apply that to different individuals. It's not, that's not what, uh, what the ulama are referring to here. But in fact, it's about ilm, it's about fiqh fi deen, that you have to have knowledge. Al-ilm qabla al-qawli wa al-amal, as Imam Bukhari said in, rahimahullah ta'ala, in uh, Sahih al-Bukhari, the chapter entitled Al-ilm al al qabla al-qawli wa al-amal, that knowledge precedes uh, statements and actions. <clears throat> the people of knowledge have mentioned that if a scholar makes a mistake, it is not correct to follow up the scholar in that mistake. Neither is it correct to dis disassociate from him due to that error. Rather, his mistake will be expi expiated and forgiven due to his many good deeds. <clears throat> from amongst those who mentioned this is Sheikh Islam ibn Taymiyyah. So this was the statement of Sheikh uh, Sheikh Abdul Masih, uh, who said, The like of these scholars who make a mistake, yet it is expiated, if they do not use their innovative statement as a criterion to divide the body of the Muslims, and they do not base their loyalty and enmity on this statement of theirs, then their statement is classed as a mistake, and Allah the Glorified uh, forgives these types of mistakes of the believers. This is imperative. Let's break this statement down. This is a statement of Shaykh Islam ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah ta'ala. He said, 
that the like of these scholars who make a mistake, meaning that everyone makes a mistake for one. As we mentioned, this hadith of the Prophet every, uh, all the children of Adam, they make mistakes, and the best of those who make mistakes is those who repent. Sheikh Islam was mentioning that the scholars who make a mistake, not based upon their desires, but they made a legitimate mistake. They, and a mistake, that includes many things. That's very general. That means a mistake, it could have been in Akhida. It could have been an act of bid'ah. It could have been an act of minhaj, yukhalaf al minhaj. Could have been a mistake in minhaj. Could have been a mistake, whatever. But if they did not make this mistake, and we're talking about scholars of Ahl Sunnah, we're not talking about scholars of Ahl Bida, you know, Khalasan, those, those scholars that are from Ahl Bida, those, you know, Hizbi scholars or those, uh, uh, you know, uh, or, uh, you know, what all the various uh, sect sectarian groups. We're not talking about them. We're talking about scholars of Ahl Sunnah that may have fallen into an act of Bida that may have fallen into a mistake, uh, may have fallen into some sort of error, okay? That as long as they, they fell into that error, not based upon their uh, desires, nor did they call to that error, their, meaning their mistake. They didn't call to it. They didn't make a new minhaj from it. They didn't make new principles based on that. They didn't make al-wala wal bara based on their mistake. Then this person will be forgiven by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because they're a person of knowledge, and they tried their best, they were honest and sincere, but they made a mistake, they didn't la yusib. And this is in accordance with the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu that we already mentioned about the, uh, the mujtahid, that if he strives uh, and he uh, gets it correct, then he has two rewards. And if he strives and he makes a mistake, then he has one reward. But he still gets reward, and he'll be forgiven for his mistake, because he strove, he had knowledge of the text, Kitabi Allah wa sunnat Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the Faham al salaf And he made ijtihad in an issue, trying to, trying to res, uh, resolve the truth, trying to, to come up with a resolution to an issue or a question or what have you. But he, he, he made a mistake in that, in that area. Maybe even fell into something that went against the minhaj of Ahl sunnah Maybe even fell into a bid'ah. That doesn't make him a muqtadi'ah. That doesn't make him, uh, you know, as Shaykh al-Islam said, he will be forgiven because it was from ijtihad. But if the person made this mistake and they called to it, as some of our brothers have even made mistakes like this, they made, they talked about principles and they implemented and they divided and split communities based upon these principles, then later they were found, these issues were found out not to be true because the brothers blind, blind followed one particular scholar who turned out to be a hizbi in the, in the long run and Sheikh Rabi and others made his, his, his affair clear that the situation, uh, the brothers, they fell into, so just think of that. Did, they fell into these errors, not being much tied, you know, being somewhat from the layman and maybe some are students of knowledge and things like this, but they, they called people to this. They made, and it affected communities around the world that people adopted some of these principles of being harsh and, and practicing some of these things. Even we hear about people, families were broken up, sisters calling, getting fatawa to, to, uh, to get a divorce from brothers who aren't even lem yufiq fi deen, that doesn't have much fiq in, this understand, in, in, in the religion. Part, you know, maybe a student knowledge, maybe. Even that's questionable. But then making fatawa that so-and-so, yes, divorce your husband. Wa'iyadu billah min dhalika. This is a big problem. This comes from a lack of understanding in the religion. And it comes from being extreme and not realizing that an alam uh, can make a mistake and fall into a bid'ah and not make him a mubtadi'ah that doesn't make him an innovator unless he's, he's making his, his love and his, his hate based upon this and the point for me mentioning that particular story I just mentioned was that because certain brothers they made al-wawab well, but all based on this, they made it, if you're not with us and you're not with these principles that we're espousing, then you are not from Ahl Sunnah, we'll warn against you, we'll talk about you, especially if you are doing da'wah. It's a big mushkila, and it caused big fitna, and it still causes big fitna. So we don't want to make our al-wala wal bara based on false principles. We want to make sure it's al-wala. Al We're loving for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Based upon what Allah azza wa jal loves, and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam loved, and the, sah and the sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhu majma'een, understood and loved but uh, and and we want to dislike what they disliked that's that's how we need to be 
That's how we need to make al-wala, wal-bara, not to my sheikh. I love my sheikh. If you don't like my sheikh, I, I don't really have that much of a problem. I would, I would question a little bit why, you know, he's, he's known from being from Ahl Sunnah or this and this and this. And, you know, many of the mashayikh that we take from. But if someone has beef with him, I'm not going to make al-wala, wal-bara based upon that. That's a big problem. That's what we have amongst many people that they not only blind follow their scholars, but then they at the same time, they make al-wala, wal-bara based upon it. Maybe the person and the sheikh have some personal issues, a, a business dealing or anything, or the sheikh, you know, the person felt the sheikh was rude in a particular situation, or whatever, that he might be distant from the sheikh or not like the sheikh or whatever. That's his prerogative and that's between him and Allah Azza wa Jal. But you do not have to make your deen based upon who loves you and your friends and your sheikhs. That's not, you know, that's not how you make your awwala wal bara. You hate those who hate who, who disagree with your sheikh in this issue or something like this. This is, this is a, a big problem that we have to begin to rectify as a community. Then the sheikh said, uh, I think we'll end there and then we'll end, uh, we'll have the next lesson to end, be in the law, to end the treaties. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us with tawfiq. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyya Muhammad wa ala alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam.